Thank you, Dr. Stoudinger, for that introduction, and thank you all so much for coming to listen to our talk today. So today we'll be discussing the use of the Maternal and Infant Network, MATLINK, to understand outcomes associated with the use of medication for opioid use disorder during pregnancy between 2014 and 2021. Now, before we begin, I wanted to give you all a little background on my interest with this topic. Um, as an undergrad student, I was involved with substance use research, specifically for opioid prescription use after surgery, but I was only really able to fully understand the impacts of the opioid crisis in my community when I started to get involved with local organizations and saw how the social determinants impacted the health of those around me. This work really got me interested in public health and eventually led me to pursue my MPH. And for my internship, I then worked at the Pan American Health Organization and World Health Organization in Washington, D.C. in the Alcohol and Substance Use Department. Um, from this experience, I actually was able to write my final teaching case on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in the Americas, combining both my interests in maternal health and substance use. Uh, this summer after an externship in family medicine and OBGYN, after my first year of medical school, um, I was really able to see everything come full circle. And the experience that really stood out to me the most was seeing a pregnant patient struggling with alcohol addiction, whose child likely had fetal alcohol syndrome. And it was a full circle moment for me because understanding those social determinants that led her to the situation and then seeing her medical management and care that I learned in medical school um, really tied everything together. So I was looking forward to diving into this research on opioid use during pregnancy uh, with my colleague Divya, who also has extensive experience in public health, and I'll pass it on to her. Thank you, Vakia. I'm excited to delve into this topic. A quick background on me. I was pursuing an MPH in epidemiology when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and I learned about the infectious disease surveillance systems available. I knew that surveillance systems required consistent coordination between several stakeholders from hospitals to the public health department, but I wasn't really sure how it all came together into a system that could both record current outbreaks and predict future ones by finding patterns. It wasn't until I joined the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine that I gained this understanding on a project analyzing the different aspects of surveillance programs like the one shown here and in DSS. So it's interesting to me that a surveillance system like the one we'll be talking about during this presentation, MATLINK, exists outside of the realm of infectious diseases. I've learned a lot about what is considered a strong system when it comes to collecting longitudinal data from this article. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll also see how beneficial it is to have a system like this in a place for public health issues like opioid use disorders. So let's get right into it. And to start us off, let's first talk about what opioid use disorder is. So what is opioid use disorder? It's defined by the CDC as the patterned usage of opioids like oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, or heroin that causes significant impairment or stress. It's a treatable chronic illness, but just in 2020, an estimated 2.7 million people aged 12 or older reported having an OUD. And there are several criteria for the diagnosis of OUDs. The two most common are unsuccessful attempts at controlling usage and usage getting in the way of fulfilling obligations of, at work or at home. And as we'll see on the next slide, opioid use disorders during pregnancies has been a public health issue for over the past, for the past decade. In the most recent estimate, it was found that the number of pregnant women with OUD at labor and delivery more than quadrupled from 1999 to 2014. OUD during pregnancy has been linked to poor health outcomes for both mothers and babies, and these outcomes include preterm and stillbirth, maternal mortality, and an umbrella condition called neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a group of conditions that causes newborns to withdraw from certain substances they were exposed to before birth. Medications for OUD have been recommended during pregnancy. These include methadone and buprenorphine. But not a lot is known about the risks for and benefits of each MOUD regimen and whether the medications result in better outcomes. So this report we'll be looking at is an MMWR, which provides a description of a sentinel surveillance system or a system with specific groups of clinical sites collecting information on MOUD during pregnancy to hopefully begin filling in these knowledge gaps. 
And before going into the paper itself, we want to define what an MMWR is. The Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or MMWR, is a publication by the CDC focused on providing epidemiological updates on different public health topics in an easy to digest manner. The data published in MMWRs is based on weekly notifications to CDC by public health departments. This publication has various formats from a standard report to policy notes and notes from the field. In our case, we're looking at a standard full report with the purpose of describing population characteristics by MOUD status from clinical sites with the results of a surveillance system evaluation as well. This information can be used by public health professionals, clinicians, and policymakers hoping to improve the care of pregnant people with OUD. I'll hand it off to Vikita to talk about the methods described in this MMWR. Thank you, Divya. So the CDC and the Public Health Informatics Institute were the two entities to establish the MATLINK, um, and MATLINK stands for Maternal and Infant Network to understand outcomes associated with medication for opioid use disorder during pregnancy. And this was created back in 2019. MATLINK is essentially a surveillance network of seven clinical sites that collect data on people with opioid use disorder during pregnancy. And as you can see on the left of the screen, there are many partners and experts within these that are involved with MATLINK, um, from federal, clinical, to public health entities. And these are all a culmination of experts, um, really what public health entails. As a future clinician, you know, we can really see where we'd eventually fit into this with our expert opinions and knowledge base, whether it's as a lead physician at the CDC or a practicing obstetrician that's a member of ACOG. It really highlights that interdisciplinary nature of healthcare and medicine, and that's what makes the study conducted on a scale like this even more fascinating to us. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of the goals of this database. So initially, MATLINK had four clinical sites, Boston Medical Center, Kaiser Northwest, Ohio State, and University of Utah. Uh, these sites were mainly selected because they had um, they already had advanced and robust data infrastructure already in place and um, some strong clinical pro protocols already present uh, that included the medication for opioid use disorder. So they were able to collect postpartum and childhood outcome data up to two years of age um, and another big thing was they were able to integrate the maternal and child data as dyads. So the data from this pair of individuals was able to stay linked, which was key for the longitudinal study. Then eventually with more funding in 2021, three more sites were added. So we had New Mexico, Rochester, and South Florida. And this was done in an effort to diversify the data that was collected to make it more representative of the national population. So ultimately, um, the seven sites are supposed to be diverse in terms of its geography, urbanicity, race and ethnicity, insurance coverage, and the type of medication used. Um, and from these sites, participants were chosen based on certain inclusion criteria, which we will look at next. So the inclusion criteria for MATLINK were um, one, all known pregnancy outcomes from January 1st, 2014 to August 31st, 2021. Um, and two, um, they were to have an ICD-CM uh, code for opioid use diagnosis. So that's the International Classification of Disease Clinical Modification Code. And there's an extensive list of codes and categories used from the ICD, a few of which you can see here. Um, in the table. Uh, but now let's take a look at how this data was collected. So the data for MATLINK um, was collected by the clinical sites from existing health services and medical records, including their EHRs, electronic health records, um, pharmaceutical management systems, lab records, public health reports, state surveillance data, and even external sources like MOUD-related visits from an outside clinic or um, other administrative sources. Um, some key differences of the seven sites, six use EPIC as their EHR, um, while one uses Cerner. And there are also some variations between each site on how data is organized and abstracted, but overall, the IT infrastructure and the data sharing are standardized at all the sites, which we will take a look at next. 
So the IT infrastructure that was used for MATLINK was developed by the CDC and the Public Health Informatics Institute and includes tools such as REDCap, XML, SQL, and uh, SharePoint as well for uh, collaboration of the files to allow the clinical sites to collaborate on the data collection. Uh, another interesting thing about their data collection methods is that both uh, the clinical sites and the CDC conduct automated and manual data checks for quality control. And the final version of the data is also sent back to the clinical site uh, for approval. So there are many steps integrated for quality control into their methods. Now let's jump back into the data and just take a look at the exposure and comparison groups in this study. So when we look at our exposure and comparison group definitions, we can see that um, exposure is our MOUD group. This is all people with a diagnosis of um, OUD during pregnancy who received MOUD in the pregnancy during that surveillance period time. This also includes people with a history of OUD before the pregnancy or those in remission. And remission is defined as someone previously diagnosed with OUD currently taking MOUD. Um, so each person can also have more than one pregnancy included in the MAT link, which would be, um, which and each pregnancy could be either in the same or different MOUD group. So those would be two different dyads. Um, and for the comparison group, this included pregnant persons with OUD who did not receive MOUD. Now, when looking specifically at MOUD, we wanted to define that, um, and it's important to recognize that this is the use of buprenorphine with or without naloxone, methadone, and naltrexone. So those can vary based on um, the individual patient. Uh, Buprenorphine-based medications that were specifically approved for the management of chronic pain, however, were not included as MOUD, as that was not its uh, purpose, but they were included um, with other medications as potential co-exposures. So now let's take a look at some of the descriptions of the variables that were used and collected. So we had um, five categories where we can see where the data came from. Um, Matlick included this longitudinal data for uh, the person who is pregnant from the beginning of their prenatal care through one year postpartum and up to six years of age for the child. Uh, so these key variable categories included maternal history, um, such as demographics, race, race ethnicity, MOUD, um, such as the initiation, duration, and dosing patterns, uh, delivery, birth, hospitalization, so the type of pain management used, any sorts of neonatal abstinence syndromes um, or withdrawal syndromes that were recognized, uh, deliver, uh, postpartum data as well, so um, anxiety, depression, um, substance use screening, and then lastly, child follow-up. So they followed the physical growth and development um, and any acute chronic conditions that the child may have had. So now that we've talked about some of the variables, let's just see how the data was initially, initially analyzed. So the findings of this paper is limited to the demographics of the study groups as it's still, MATLINK is still in its early stages. Um, but the six that were analyzed by MOUD treatment status are maternal age, race, ethnicity, insurance status, and urbanicity. Um, since the study is ongoing, these clinical and outcome data are not yet included um, since the data collection and cleaning have not yet been completed. But this analysis did begin in 2023. Um, but with the analysis that has been conducted with those six demographics, um, demographic characteristics I did mention, um, the differences in those characteristics were examined by chi-score tests, and the statistical significance was indicated by a p-value less than 0.05. Um, and now I'll pass it on to Divya to discuss the results. Thanks, Vikita. So like Vikita mentioned, the authors analyzed selected demographic characteristics of people who are pregnant overall and by MOUD treatment status from the seven clinical sites. And this is between 2014 and 2021. And the authors found that of 5,541 pregnancies, 5,626 unique pregnant person infant dyads were identified. Among the 5,541 pregnancies, about 80% included persons who received MOUD. Just as a reminder, MOUD included the use of buprenorphine with or without naloxone, methadone, or naltrexone during pregnancy. 
The mean recorded maternal age across all pregnancies in MATLINK was 29.7 years with a standard deviation of about 5.1 years. And the overall maternal race distribution showed that the majority of patients included in MATLINK were white, though there is a small percentage who are Black, American Indian, or Alaskan Native, multiracial, or Asian and Native Hawaiian. In addition, a little over a fourth of mothers in the system were Hispanic or Latino. Insurance status across various pregnancies showed that the majority of mothers were on public insurance at delivery. And the last demographic characteristic, urbanicity, was looked at based on rural urban commuting, commuting area codes, which categorized zip codes by commuting distance. And it was found that about 84.4% of people lived in or within a reasonable commuting distance to urbanized areas. The next slide summarizes the results into one main takeaway. Those receiving MOUD were more likely to be white, older, and have public insurance. We also want to note that all demographic characteristics mentioned in the last slide were found to be significantly different between pregnant persons receiving and not receiving MOUD, except ethnicity and urbanicity. Now we'll look at the other portion of the results, the evaluation of MATLINK itself. So the MATLINK surveillance system was evaluated based on 11 criteria. The first is simplicity in structure and an ease of operation. MATLINK simplified data collection with operations built by CDC, such as an automated EHR extraction. Extraction tools were found to be easy to use with minimal knowledge required to operate the system based on detailed standardized operating procedures or SOPs. MATLINK was also evaluated on its flexibility in changing variables with little time. The system proved its flexibility with the ability to add new clinical sites and variables like treatment modalities with very few changes to the system. Data quality or the completeness and the validity of the data recorded was indirectly assessed through site staff interviews. The authors mentioned that one challenge to the data quality was the completeness and correctness of EHR data being collected and extracted. Interviewed collaborators did agree, though, that MATLINK data was high quality, but it was suggested to standardize missing variable values and to add additional trainings. The criteria for acceptability or the willingness to participate in the surveillance system was met as interviews showed site staff were interested in using the system. But based on feedback to reduce the number of variables and difficulty of data collection, 10% of the variables in MATLINK were changed from required to optional. The next set of criteria starts with sensitivity, which is the ability to detect pregnancies that meet inclusion criteria. Feedback showed that MATLINK was comprehensive in collecting patient information, but pregnant persons without OUD, but who might have opioid dependence due to conditions like chronic pain, may not have been captured by MATLINK due to the inclusion criteria. Also, people with OUD who did not receive prenatal care from clinical sites, but delivered at their site may not have been captured. Positive predictive value is a proportion of reported cases that actually have the health-related event under surveillance. The current data were insufficient to see the PPB of variables, but lab tests were used as an alternative standard. These showed a high predictive value for diagnoses of infections like hepatitis C, and this shows alternative uses for the sur surveillance system itself. Representativeness describes the occurrence of a health-related event over time and its distribution in the population by place and person. There were initially four clinical sites using MATLINK, and these were found to not be representative of the U.S., as the South and the Southwest regions and the Black, Hispanic, and uninsured populations were not well represented. The sites, though, were representative of OUD-affected pregnancies in their respective areas. The addition of three more clinical sites added the required regional and racial representation. The last set of criteria begins with timeliness. So MATLINK has been shown to provide timely data on long-term outcomes at six years for immediate evaluation, since it includes deliveries from 2014 onwards. It also met the criteria for stability or the reliability and availability of the system to collect data when needed by using CDC systems, which are known as for being highly stable. This system uses a modern data architecture for secure collection, storage, analysis, and sharing of data, and any issues the clinical sites face were re resolved on the same day and collaboration was supported. So staff members found the system to serve it and service quality to be pretty high. 
Lastly, in terms of informatics interoperability, all data was captured electronically and a plan was developed to return clean data to the clinical sites and make data available to others as well. I'll hand it over to Vikita to talk us through the discussion. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the strengths of this paper and the MATLIC surveillance system itself. So one of the biggest things is that it's the first surveillance system to collect this comprehensive linked dyad based data that's related to MOUD during pregnancy from multiple channels across the country. It's also able to maintain confidentiality through um, its robust IT architecture and those multiple layers of data validation for its quality control. Uh, this large scale study also facilitates the collaboration among the clinical sites, CDC and PHII, um, especially with its automated data flow from the clinical sites to the CDC databases and servers, allowing for that seamless data collection. Uh, so now Divya is going to discuss some of the limitations. Thanks. So there were five overall limitations presented in this MMWR. First, it's important to note that data collection and cleaning are ongoing, so the analysis of current selected population characteristics may be slightly different from future analyses. This leads to the second limitation, which was that outcome data were not available for analyses. The team was still completing chart review and abstraction when this MMWR was published. The descriptive statistics presented in this paper could still be expanded on once this data becomes available for future analysis. There are not all the data fit into controlled medical vocabularies. The system operators did try to use normalized naming systems, but standardization was difficult, difficult across the clinical sites because of the lack of standardized discrete fields in the EHRs. In other words, the methods for data entry and word usage for the same variable may differ across sites. The fourth limitation ties into this as well. Certain variables like race and ethnicity and insurance status could be misclassified or incompletely recorded as they're not collected in the same way across all the clinical sites and even within clinical sites. Some sites may use self-report or external assessments to collect race and ethnicity data. Others use other methods. To address this, consideration was given to combining the race and ethnicity data, but they remain separate to get further perspective on the study population. Variables like insurance status vary throughout pregnancy and postpartum, so data may not be consistently reported between the clinical sites, and this ended up making it difficult to compare results across the data, st data set. It's also possible inconsistent data collection occurs if people delivered or received care outside of the clinical site, making data difficult to connect, collect and may lead to missing data. Lastly, important demographic variables like the highest educational level were not included in the paper as they were poorly documented in the EHRs. It's possible that future analyses will be able to expand on these. Vikita will now go into the conclusions. Okay, so now to conclude, um, we can see that these preliminary findings show us the important markers of possible differences in healthcare access and clinical care. Uh, MATLINK is still evolving and growing, and we're excited to see the analysis of more of the longitudinal data. Uh, because of its robust structure, MATLINK will be able to influence and strengthen other projects of such scale as well. And it's continuing to improve with um, these, especially with the findings of these analyses and um, the growth that CDC is making with the database itself. And ultimately, uh, the goal for them is to support clinical and public health decision-making to improve these health outcomes for pregnant persons with OUD and their children. Now, looking towards the future, some of the next steps would involve broadening care to all substance use, like, for example, alcohol use during pregnancy, by taking the lessons learned from this current work and expanding the scope. This data can also inform further collaboration with clinicians and epidemiologists to guide the national standards for these linked dyad-based data. Um, and since the MATLINK protocol is standardized in many ways and it's improving, um, there is potential for it to be used by any healthcare system. And it also has that flexibility to collect longitudinal data even beyond six years in children. So we might see um, the study progressing in that way as well. Uh, lastly, something that Divya and I believe to be important is the consideration of uh, other social determinants of health, such as the health policies and politics that influence the availability of things like harm reduction, um, 
since we already know that legalization or funding for certain initiatives vary based on state and region, um, and since many of these patients in this study are under public insurance, it would be really interesting to collect data on these regional differences and include it in future discussions as well and make sure that um, those data collection methods are standardized so we can analyze that data. Um, a great example of this is something that we were looking into is that a third of the states in a third of the states here, Medicaid will cover the cost of buprenorphine, but not methadone. And something to consider is if these differences are because of policy or evidence-based medicine. So just to conclude, looking at our future role as clinicians, I think we both agree that it's important to consider the social determinants of health when considering not just this topic, but everything in medicine. And there are complex psychosocial, environmental, and political factors that impact the care of these groups. And with something like MATLINK, which aims to create a comprehensive nationwide database, um, it's informing these upstream community level changes. And it's great to see that as physicians, we can not only make an impact on the individual level with our patients, but on an upstream scale too, to help with those population level changes. So thank you all for listening and we're open to any questions you may have.